Good night, everyone. Just a what about that? Be in a moment. Just Oops. show you a couple of small, some little time-saving, eye-saving, finger-saving tools that we we um, make and use in the workshop. This is a Remington 700 bolt. People will tell me they're easy to get apart. Sure, they are. But they're easier to get apart when you've got a tool that will hang on to them. I just made up this little aluminium sleeve and in it it's got a, a bolt and a T-handle that will pull the bolt, move the bolt up and down the slot in the side there. Fits onto the shroud on the 700 bolt. Do up the, just a couple of turns, takes the spring pressure up. Unscrew the bolt. Unscrew the uh, fire and pin and spring assembly with the shroud and so on. Now you've got a strip bolt. You can clean it, do whatever you need to. Uh, as in this one, we put a Seiko extractor in it because the guy had a stuck case and it tore the uh, original Remington extractor out and tore a piece of the face of the bolt out. So you can't put a Remington extractor back in there. So we just you mill and drill a bit of a Psycho extractor kit. They work beautifully in there. But now you've got your um, flooring pin and spring assembly out. How are you going to get it apart? Well, there's another little piece here. The same thing, we use threads a lot to do a lot of work for us at different times. Which this tube has got the Remington thread in that end, just a half UNC thread in this end. A little wind up handle, crank handle. Takes the pressure up. Take the shroud, and the uh, sleeve and the, the uh, puller assembly off. And now if you want to take this bolt completely apart and replace the spring, you just crank it up until the the uh, striker comes out through the shroud, knock the pin out, unwind it, release the spring pressure, reverse it to put it back together. It's, um, it's a really smart little tool um, I've used just about every week I would use this. Because we're always fixing Remingtons. Because we're always fixing Remingtons. Yeah. That's right, and I've, I've made a similar similar thing for Howers Weatherby bolts and also for Rugers because you need them, sooner or later you'll need them for all of those rifles. So do we sell those tools? We don't, but if anyone wants one I can easy, I can easily knock one up for them. They're not that difficult to make. I've got a couple of different shrouds. Remington have a couple of different over the, over the years they have a, changed the shape of the shroud a little and Stiller, which are a clone of Remington, have a different cut contoured shroud as well. So I've got one for them as well. It just makes it so much easier to um, to do it rather than trying to put hold this in a vise, pull it, undo the, unwind the bolt out of it. Um, there's always chances of something slipping and then you uh, hunt for an hour or so to find the part that you just lost. Uh, which is uh, a real pain in the neck, absolute pain in the neck. So here, a couple of... So, once, saving time, saving tool. On a Saturday morning once, I had a client who had a Ruger M77-22 that they bought in that was misfiring. And you know the shape of the M77 22s, the striker assembly is not that far different from the striker assembly on that Ruger. It's got a claw thing on the Anyway, I wanted to take it apart to um, to see if the if there was any shit in the bolt that was yeah. stopping the bolt from dropping forth. And so you know the Rugers, you pull the striker and turn them. Yeah. Well, I did that and it dropped back on the next round and bit me on the skin between my finger and my thumb. 
and I couldn't get it out. I couldn't pull it out, and I couldn't. I didn't have the strength. It was at a weird angle. I couldn't get it in a vice to pull it out to do it up. I walked around with this thing on my hand for about fifteen minutes because the only other person that was here was Nick, and she couldn't help me. And um, yeah, I walked around for about fifteen minutes with this thing attached to my hand. And so it's, it is really important to use the right tooling yeah. for the right job. That's right. Oh, um, yeah. Otherwise, you end up in all sorts of predicaments. Uh-huh. But you used to be able to just pull a Remington bolt shroud apart with a five cent coin. Once upon a time. Same as the Omar. Yeah, very similar to Omar, yeah. But they're not like that anymore. Not like that anymore, no. Yeah. But, um, now, Jason Spencer's granddad has a Bren gun, apparently. And he wants to know what the process of rendering it would be. <laughs> allegedly. Ha- allegedly. Uh, so if someone has a Category D firearm, um, I'm not 100% sure at the moment in WA because it's a lot rather ambiguous compared to other states on whether there is an amnesty going on uh, still because Carlo Callahan made it quite... In him trying to big note himself, made it a little bit wishy washy about whether the after the last amnesty was on, whether the amnesty would continue. Now, that's probably a question for police licensing whether there's still an amnesty on, but we have rendered firearms for uh, individuals category as days. category days as well as for the museum. So, if you go to the museum, there's actually a few category days. MGO8s and that sort of stuff on display there that we actually rendered for them. And so now that so we can do the work, the question is, is is it legal to bring it into us? Not really, because it's not a licensed firearm. Um, you'd need to get a temporary permit from police licensing. That would be my recommendation. Yeah. Would be get a temporary permit so you can get it to us and then we'll be able to and, and we'll be able to render it in a way that sort of respects the 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 look and the shape. The, the look integrity. and the shape and yeah, the the integrity of the yeah. firearm as yeah. much as possible. So Yeah, when we rented the MGO eight and a couple of Vickers and an Owen gun and a couple of other pieces for the museum, um I've been to the museum and seen one of our uh renders there, the one of the MGO eights and um if you know what you're looking for, you know it's not a complete firearm, but otherwise it, it looks like a complete firearm to a novice, it certainly would. And it is a shame, and there's a lot of people that are going to be saying, oh, don't render it, blah, 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 because it is a real shame. But at the end of the day, if the police get a hold of it, okay, it's just right. going to get destroyed, you yeah. know. So, um, And it's better off getting someone who's experienced like Bill to render these things correctly so you can keep them rather than... Um, perhaps not get them rendered correctly yeah. and lose some of the, the history and the story yeah. that the firearm holds. Because so, yeah. it was a brand gun, you can bet your ass it's seen, it's been up in the tropics, you know? Yeah, so, and it'll be a bit rusty. Oh, I just yeah. mean it'll have a story to tell. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, another question that was asked, what is that on the barrel behind Bill's head? Oh, we're gonna talk that, about that in a minute. That is not what you think it is. It's not on the barrel. Oh, that thing. I think oh, you're talking that. about that one. Oh, it's a brake. Black one? Yeah. It's a muzzle brake. So this is a muzzle brake that I made for Ross because he's... Because it's a sexy fucking looking gun. Uh, is it? You struggling there, mate? Yeah. So it's... Uh, if you have a look at the Barrett, uh, they make a 50 cal semi-automatic and it's got a muzzle brake suppressor that looks like this, yeah? So it's muzzle brake at the front and then they've got a big suppressor. Now this one, the barrel goes all the way through the suppressor. The, the barrel doesn't end here, the barrel ends there. This is just a cover, just for looks, yeah? So, you'll see that that actually screws off. And just that part is the muzzle brake itself. Was that the one you are asking about, Brett? But anyway, if you want to see more of it, there's pictures on our custom design page on the website. So this is just another custom brake that we do. So literally, you can bring a picture of anything in here and we'll make it. There is absolutely zero recoil in this rifle. 
for those that will be asking. Because he can't get it off the shelf. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he can't shoot it, it when it's up there. 6.5 gay. <laughs> <laughs> what else have you got here, Bill? Oh, uh, this is a. Uh, <laughs> so, for those people who don't know, we actually do do a lot of pistol smithing. Yeah. For example, while throw P400s. Yeah, we do a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've had about eight of them, I think, in the last year or so. A lot of them, anyway, yeah. Unfortunately, they, they seem to have uh, an inbuilt problem that occurs and. Uh, not terribly expensive for parts wise, but they're an intricate little piece of gear and they do take a bit of time to to get a part and back together again and make sure it's And the parts are hard to get. Parts. And that part that you're talking about is an intricate part. Like it's yeah. not something that you could just spin up on your lathe no. and expect it to work. No, it's um and But you work on other pistols as well, don't oh, you? Oh yeah. yeah. You work a lot on because you've got a certain pedigree, don't you? Like you, you've got a a certain um, industry background that you come from yeah. in regards to smithing. You shot light level set pistols. Yeah, I shot light level set pistols since 1973 until about 2005 or six. Yeah, thereabouts. And yeah, I had a lot to do with certainly a lot to do with Pardini's. Um, I shot Pardini's of all manner. Myself and modified mine to, to optimise it, especially in a rapid fire gun. But that's by the board now because there's no such thing as um, rapid fire short anymore. Um, but oh, revolvers, single shot, you know, Vostoks and Hamley might have been in those causes. Um, Recently, Thompson Contender. <laughs> yeah, uh, all sorts. It's all good fun. One of the things we, we run into a, um, with pistols is people wanting sights changed. And on the, um, mainly on a, a 9mm semi autos, uh, that. Uh, 38 Super and more. Yeah, 38 Super, the, on various makes. And here we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different adapters that go on this this bracket, and the the, the top slide slides onto that. Whatever make it might be, that's uh, Beretta APX. And here we have a little pusher, another thread. Threads work wonderful to exert pressure on things, and that with a little brass. Um, sleeve on the end of it, little brass sleeve fits on the end so it doesn't damage anything. Brass is softer than steel so it won't harm the steel. Uh, and that, that pushes the side out and then same thing, push a new one in. Why can't you just bash it out with a hammer? Like a brass hammer and a drift. You could, and a lot of people do. And uh, sometimes it doesn't do the slide much good. Or the side. So well, if you've got tritium sights, like glowing in the dark sights, and you smash the little thing Yeah, in. the tritium sights, you can't knock them out with a hammer, otherwise you'll ruin them. The tritium... You might get the incredible Hulk powers, though. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. From the tritium. Yes, from yeah. the radioactivity in the, the tritium, yeah, that's right. Particularly if you lick no, it, if you don't... I don't think you will, it's not quite enough, but I, um, I give up glowing about five seconds after you hit them. Yeah. So don't, if you got <coughs> glow in the dark, you got any thoughts? Pardon? SIG 226, yeah. Glock, that's that Beretta APX. Yeah. What's that one? Beretta 92. That's got nothing written on it. CZ. CZ oh, 75. Yeah, I can't remember what that is. It'll come to me one day. But probably you've made all those, haven't you? Yeah. It's probably so well used. That's probably a 2011 frame. Yeah. All sorts. That's got nothing. A couple right of screws that hold it together. Must be another tool that you made. <laughs> yeah. You welded up out of scrap. scrap. Yeah, out of a bit of scrap. Is this the first one you made? It is, but I've, I've added to it. <laughs> it was just this piece here. 
and then you bend shit out of it, and so you put some straightening and yeah. strengthening bits on it. Yeah, a bit of straightening and strengthening paint, and uh, to... hey presto, a bit more angle iron here, and a couple of drill holes drilled. To turn it to face the light so we can see it a bit better. So yeah. it's, um, they're different heights, <laughs> thread, threaded threads for the pusher screw, um, but it works a treat. Um, yeah, and I'm sure if, if I had to get someone to make that, it would have been a couple hundred bucks. And the rest probably yeah, wouldn't yeah. have. Yeah, you would probably be. buy one, but yeah, one can. is good. We'll make one. Um, you probably fuck up after about two or three. Well, that's, sites, but. that's what I've seen on the on the net about, about them. They, um, they work well if the site's not very hard to move. Mm. <clears throat> and some of these sites, I don't know how, I noticed the manufacturers get them into the dovetail without damaging them. They must have a, like a hydraulic press or something. It's something just, like a jig that just drop it in and yeah. whoop, just push it in there. Yeah, it there probably wasn't a dovetail there before they pushed the <laughs> side. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't the right size. Or no, that's yeah. it. They machine a half, mill, mill and a half undersized yeah, yeah, yeah. and just press the side in. Yeah. That's the size it ends up. Fuck the hard. But, but normally get them out. Um, haven't had to use an oxy torch on them yet, but I'm sure we will one day. Yeah. You want to talk about your shotgun? Yeah, this is just a little project I had for the last day or two. It was, it's an Impala. Straight Tur pull. Turkish made straight pull shotgun, 12 gauge. It had a five shot mag and the guy wanted something bigger. So we, um, we make these magazine tubes to suit whatever Shotgun, we've been, we made them for Adlers for four or five years now. Is that how long well, we made them for lever actions originally, and they started that's making right. them in 2015. Did we? That's six years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we've been making this this idea for a long time. Right. Catch you later, mate. See you later. See you. See you, Ross. But the Impalas are a bit different, aren't they? Uh, the Impalas different in, in oh. quite a bit in that uh, the... Uh, well, that nut's different for a start. Yeah. So on the on the Adlers, the fore end finishes where the nut is. Yeah, and it's just got a little short nut. Yeah. But on these, the nut is down inside the fore end. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. On the original one, and the the end of the nut is blank over. Yeah. Like so, a Dickinson, a Dickinson's just blank as well. Yeah, and so um, you can't just add add a tube like this and have it come out through the nut. So I had to make a new nut to hold it all together. Mm. And, <clears throat> and it has to be an extra long one so you can get out and whatnot. Yeah, and we made... Well, at least it's easier than the Dickinson. Yeah. Well, the Dickinson, the magazine doesn't go through the, through that, through the lug on the barrel. Lug on the barrel. It's just got a pissy little one, and the cap has a like an eight mil rod that goes through it. Oh, yeah. You just do up a little eight mil nut to hold the barrel in. Oh, good. Stay there. Yeah, they do, but you can't extend the magazines on them without getting rid of that lug on the barrel. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, which I have done, but it's pondering. So we'll send this off to get um, Cerakoted. Uh, she's now, was a five shot, now an eight shot. Um, I think the guy will be pretty happy with a bit extra magazine. The magazine, yeah, the thread's a little bit tight. It's got a... It'll be tight, tight. well once you've got two layers of Cerakote on it, it might get a bit tighter, that's all. Yeah, well, well you've got a tap for it though. So. Yeah. Do we make mu muzzle brakes for a Ruger Precision 22 wind mag? Make muzzle brakes for anything. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk about a self-timing one or? Sure. Well, I mean, is the Ruger Precision already threaded? Ruger Precision rimfire is, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, if it's already threaded, then I can make a self-timing brake and just post it out to them. So they're 325. So this is a self-timing brake, so I'll just do it up. So it just looks like any of our other brakes but you screw it onto the gun, and then if it doesn't time up, you've got this timing nut, which is on a left-hand thread, so it won't slip. So you just do the timing nut up, and then when you crank the, the muzzle brake up, it sits time, and it won't move. 
so it'll fit. I just have to make one for half inch 28 or half inch 20 or whatever your thread is, and then I can just send this to you in the mail and you just screw it on and it's done. Yeah? So they're 325. If you want a custom muzzle brake manufactured and you want to bring a gun in for us to do to do one of them, they start from about 395. And they we make them like 20 cal. You just tell us what caliber yours is and we bore them to suit. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Yeah. All good. What's this one? This is a um, Parker Hale Safari Deluxe in 375 run, this one. That's big caliber. Yeah, 375 Rubik. Uh, Remington Ultramag. So it's normally got a muzzle brake on that one. Yeah, okay. it has. There's a muzzle brake for it. Yeah. Um, but the guy wants express sight on it. And as things are at the moment, this last couple of, this last year anyway, product's hard to get. We normally could buy a rear and a front sight. Front express, express sight like such. That's a little one that I've got for a real skinny barrel years ago. Yeah. And never ended up using it. So we we managed to get a, a rear sight for it, which I fitted already to the Yeah, you'll have to the, change the contour. Yeah, the contour. I've got got the threads in the right place and the right depth and everything. We just got to contour the bottom underneath of the um, sight body and to because it looks looks like it's around about a uh, a 19 millimeter three quarter probably diameter radio, uh, diameter under it so we need to re re uh, re profile re profile that and then because we can't buy a at the moment can't buy a express sight with big enough to go on this barrel we're making our own and this is the start of it. Zane's done this much in his um, in his CNC. We've got um, pretty much very close to the right right diameter. It it goes onto the onto the barrel that needs to be fitted because the barrel slightly tapered, so we'll have to to um, fit the um, sight to the the tube to the barrel, and then. I'll do all the hard bits. Are you going to fit it? Yeah, I'll fit it. You want to show people how to fit it? No. How you fit it? No, that's trade secret. It, it comes with the instructions when you buy one. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. That's why we take them out of the box. You don't hone the front sight blocks out. You stretch them. Yeah, we know. Yeah. It's, it just might blow some people's minds. It takes a lot of a lot of skill to do it, but you. When you push put that on there, you don't turn the barrels down at all. The barrels stay yeah. same profile. The insides of these don't change. Like you don't hone the insides. You actually have got a special tool, a very special tool for actually stretching them to make them fit perfectly over the barrel. Because then you don't need to. We don't need to solder them or anything. That way you don't get lines when you re-blow it. You don't get silver lines around the edges and all that sort of shit. Yeah. I reckon you should just cut some ports in that and call it a muzzle brake. Yeah, that's it. Just drill a hole. Just leave that on there. Yeah. Just drill a hole in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the special tool is a is a uh, mallet. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, you just push it on and, and gently, or ruggedly, whichever you like, um, hammer it around, around here. I'll show them. And it stretches it slightly. You just push it on a bit further and, you, and hammer hammer around there and it, you get it so that it slides on perfectly and it's a perfect fit to the barrel contour. You need a nice hammer. So this is a nice old hammer that Bill's had for a long time. It's nice and flat and hard. And smooth. And smooth, yeah. So you don't yeah, fuck yeah. up your thing too much. Now you just want to make sure it's knocked on a little bit and then it'll be tight. And it'll be tight here because that's the barrel tapers as it comes down and gets bigger. So it'll be tighter at the bottom here. So you just need to hit the... All the way around like that. Now you'll do that several times 
to, and by doing that, you're actually hitting and squashing out the seal and making it stretch slightly. And by doing that, then you'll be able to knock that on a bit further. And then you do it again and you keep going until it's all the way on. And it's a perfect fit. All you're left with is some marks just around the edge here. Because I'm using a nice smooth hammer, they're not too bad. And then you'll just pile those marks off. And then you're left with a nice, beautiful, nicely finished um, sight. Now, obviously, this one, we haven't relieved this away yet. So we've got to relieve that away. And we've got to taper in the, the top of the, the rail. So it looks like that. And then we've got to dovetail it for whatever front sight that we put on there. Um, we've got to work out what height we need. Um, and then there's a plunger that holds the front side in and a plunger that holds the hood on and a screw that holds this in place. So there's a lot of work left to do, um, but that's the general gist of it. So it's, it takes a lot of patience because um, if you hit it wrong, you know, if you just, if you were to hit it slightly incorrectly just on this edge here, you could mark it permanently and take you a long while to get it out, you know, and you don't want to do that. You want to hit it, take your time, and just hit it around the edge, um, and then knock it on. So you just you're better off just leaving it to build. <laughs> just get build it. You just leave it to me. I'll do all the all the hard work. But um, now what else have we got to talk about? What are you going to talk about? Um, so we've spoken about all that. Now last week I spoke about about um, collets, and so you would have seen that my Collet block that I use for my barrel vise is this one here. So this is an ER50 collet block that I made um, to suit those size collets. So they're the big collets. They go up to 34 mil. The next size down is my ER40 collet. This is my ER40 collet block. That goes up to 26 millimeters and then ER32. So they're my common ones because these two in particular, my CNC uses them. But what I, the problem, a couple of problems that I had was getting in really nice and in a very narrow sort of area um, that these are, are too big for. Um, and also work holding, holding little tiny things to work on them and that sort of stuff. And so I went, I skipped ER25, which is the next size down, and I went to the ER16s. So these are the little ER16 collets. Um, they do up to 9mm, I believe. Um... And then I got some even smaller ones, some ER11. So this is a little ER11 collet block. So he's just a little collet block for holding 0.5 up to one millimeter things. But what it is, the beauty about what I can do with this is I can put a screw in there and hold the screw body you know, back to front and actually will hold a piece of material and actually thread it and make little screws. So if we need to make a replacement screw, if you've got a specific screw on an old shotgun or something like that, um, that's a one-off, you know, it's not something you can buy on the shelf and it's certainly not something you could buy with a screw slotted head or anything like that, then we can make this sort of stuff. So that's specifically what I got these for. These are for, for tool holding, but I use them for work holding because I, I really like collet tooling. Um, so that's what's, I'm being excited about this week. Had all that shit rock up. Um, so a question. So you guys, um, we get a lot of questions about barrels and about fluting, about what the benefits of fluting are. Do, does it reduce the weight? Well, yeah, it does reduce the weight, but does it reduce it? Does it increase surface area? So does it help cooling? Um, how much weight does it take out? What I wanted to ask you guys is that if we've got a barrel like Trent's like the one on the bottom, the flutes are typically uh, quarter wide, about 6 mil to 6.3 millimetre wide flutes, and they're usually about 500 mil long. And now his barrel's got seven flutes on it. Like wood have, wood. Yeah, wood, yeah. yeah. But typically, most barrels have six flutes on them. So I want people to have a crack at how much six flutes, 500 mil long, reduces the weight of a barrel. Anyone gets it? Anyone gets it, they win this loophole carbon fibre knife. It's not carbon fibre. It's carbon fibre. Look oh, at the handle on. Oh, the handle maybe. Yeah, the handle, yeah. No, the knife, yeah, the handle's mm -hmm. carbon fibre. Oh, it's 
How much the blade's that, not carbon. How much does that reduce the weight of that knife? Well, the, the weight that it reduces, the barrel, is more than what this what knife make, weighs. Is that right? But, yeah. So the, the amount it reduces it is that much. So it's a piece of 35 mil bar, 44 mil long. So that's the, the volume of the steel. Yeah. So. so people have a crack at how much it reduces the weight. Now, what is the benefit? So for a long time, a lot of people have said that milling the, the flutes in the barrel increases the surface area, and it does. I did some maths before, and on a standard sort of barrel similar to that, the surface area is increased by about 23% over if you didn't have a flute. So that 23% increase to the air would increase the surface area that you know heat would dissipate from. Yeah. But it also depends on how readily heat would dissipate out of whatever material you've got and how thick the air is to for the for the air to take the heat away. For the air to radiate for the heat to radiate away. So it depends on a lot of different things. One one thing I remember from my apprenticeship when we were talk, we were learning about cooling. Was this that, is before anyone knew anything about cooling. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, it was, um, it was, because uh, just to give you an idea how old I am, one of the things we learned about in the cooling systems was a thermocycling system on the old single cylinder bloody uh, lighting plant motors. So and that thermocycling, <laughs> so I'm guessing it's about cooling of the fluid causes it to siphon yeah, fluid back into the system. The, the water that's that is made hot in the engine gets hot in the engine. Hot stuff rises, so it goes up a pipe and into a tank. And as it, it cools in the tank, the tank is just radiating heat through the no no pump, no fan, nothing. Water goes into the top of the tank, cools, comes out the bottom and into the bottom of the motor. Yeah, well that's the that's the purpose of a radiator on a vehicle. It's exactly, but it's not a radiator. It's just a a, a drum of water. There's no no cooling fins, no fan, no yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing. But one thing I did, what I was going to say, the, one of the sort of laws of uh, dissipating heat is you need a medium and you need movement. Mm. So the medium is air. In in our case, when you're shooting a rifle, you're out in the open, and if you've got movement of the medium, like wind, it's going to cool quicker. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you're driving a car, it works better because you're travelling at, a, at right. some speed yeah. to allow the wind to draw through. And that's why they put thermo fans on radiators to draw more air through to dissipate the heat. And another way of doing it is having a water to water radiating system. That's right. You know, or some sort of fluid medium. Ships or boats use water to water. Yeah. To be able to dissipate the heat yeah. faster. Yeah because the air is actually a pretty poor conductor of, yeah. of heat. Well, that was, the, the three things was surface area, a medium to take the heat away, and movement. Yes. You know, well, I mean, they would also include on that, therefore, nowadays, they would include the medium itself, the specific heat capacity of the medium. So whatever medium you're moving through it to dissipate the heat into, yeah. that would need to have a heat capacity you know, or readily radi um, what, conduct the heat yeah. Yeah. and Dissip dissipate it. Yeah. Because metal actually has a relatively low specific heat capacity, which means that you don't have to put very much heat into a medium, like a metal, to increase its temperature. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, because it doesn't dissipate the heat quickly. No, because it absorbs heat quickly. Yeah. So, it, and it does dissipate heat quickly as well. Yeah. It, will, it will easily dump heat. Yeah. But we did an experiment at university where we had two Bunsen burners set up and they were set to the exact same amount. Um, so they were putting the same amount of energy into two objects. One was a beaker of water and the other one was a lump of metal. Yeah. And the beaker of water, after about five minutes, the beaker of water, you could stick your finger in it still. It was about 40 degrees. Yeah. The piece of metal, if you flick water on it, it would boil. Yeah. So the metal had, had gotten over 100 degrees. Yeah. 
while the beaker of water, because the beaker of water, water has a high specific heat capacity. It soaks up a lot of energy to only increase a small amount in temperature, whereas metal only takes a small amount of energy to increase it a large amount. Yeah. So, so that's, that's so, the problem with firearms then, especially up around the, the Knox form on a barrel. Well, that's right, because there's a lot of energy put into that. Yeah. Um, but, so the question is, is which is more important though? The fluting to increase surface area and dissipate <laughs> heat, or having that material still in the barrel to actually work as a heat sink to conduct the heat away, you know, to spread it out amongst the barrel. Yeah. My argument, and this is what I said before, is I reckon there's probably, like like there is in a lot of instances, there's probably a, a zero game, you know, there's a zero sum here. It's probably yeah. it's probably about even. Mm. You know, the material yeah. that you take out, that much metal that you take out of the barrel, could have been left in it and it would conduct the heat, you know, it would work as a heat sink, yeah. you know? So, Sorry, but, man. so I don't think there's any advantage as far as heat dissipation to fluting a barrel. Yeah. So why would you flute a barrel? Weight. Weight, yes, yeah. and rigidity. Yeah. So if you've got two barrels that weigh exactly the same, one's fluted and one's not, the one that was fluted would have started bigger in diameter. Because it would have started bigger and then they fluted it to get the weight out of it and now it's the same weight as another one. So if it's bigger in diameter, if it started off bigger in diameter, it's going to be more rigid because the bigger the diameter, at a, at a, at a factor of to the power of four, increases the rigidity of barrel. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like <coughs> it's to the fourth power, you know, if you're, if you're doubling and then doubling and then doubling, it's to the fourth power of that, you know, that you're increasing the rigidity. It's exponentially more rigid the bigger in diameter you get. Mm. And so increasing the di diameter of the barrel, even if you're wasting sections of the barrel with the fluting, increasing the diameter increases the rigidity, yeah. which means that the more rigid the barrel, <coughs> the finer the, the, var the variations in the frequency of the, of the vibrations in the barrel, which means you're going to have much more consistent shots. Yeah. So and better that, accuracy. And that's why varmint barrel, people who want to shoot long range, want to have heavy barrels. But it's only a necessary if you come under a weight restriction or if you want to try and minimise the weight of the firearm. Like if there's no weight restriction, then you just build the biggest, yeah, heaviest right. fucking thing you can find. Because yeah. then that's going to be more stable on the bags. It's going to let yeah. you shoot it easier as well depending on where the weight is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if all the weight's out the front, makes it very hard to point the gun, you know? It's very hard yeah. to, it feels unwieldy. Same as if the butt's too heavy, it's too hard to point the front of the gun. It needs to be nice, even weight throughout mm -hmm. the gun. Um, but yeah, so if anyone, have we got any guesses so far at how much weight's taken out of a barrel? We've had a couple. It? So, let's see if I can scroll around on this. It's a little bit buggered. We had, oh, what is going on with this thing? We've got 73 grams. I think it's a bit more than 73. 73? No, it's a bit more than 73, yeah. We've got 300. It's a little bit more than 300. So 250 and 200 are out then. Yep. And 180 as well. Yep. How about 350? 350, you're getting very close. Yeah? Who said 350? That was David Hughes. I'm inclined to call it, yeah? Mm -hmm. David. Yeah, I'll give David the knife. Well done, David. David Hughes is the winner of the knife. So, the weight that you take out of a barrel with every flute that you, that you do is 500 mil long flute is around just shy of 63 grams per flute. So it's about 370 grams for six flutes on a, on a six fluted barrel. That's how much weight you get out of it. So, well done. Um, 350 grams, it doesn't sound like a lot, like that's 350 grams, 370 grams, somewhere around there. Um, it's not a lot, but it's out in front of you, so it, it can actually change the, the balance of the rifle quite considerably. You, you feel it, if yeah. you picked up two rifles, that 
were 370 grams different in barrel weight. You pick it, you know, you know it for sure, yeah. The, um, Quite a bit when that's hanging out. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't take out as much as what people think, you know. If you're shooting competition and you're 500 grams overweight, you're not going to get underweight by fluting the barrel. No, you might not. So by knocking three inches off and then fluting it. You yeah, might. you might get that yeah. much out of it. So, like I said, that's 44 mils of. So what's 44 mils? Inch and a. Inch and three quarters. Inch and three. Yeah. Inch and five eight. Inch and five eight. Yeah. That's inch and five eighths of barrel of a 35 millimeter barrel, you know? So that's, you know, probably double what <clears throat> means. So you could knock three inches off the barrel and you're still only gonna lose 300, 400 grams. You know? Don't, don't so, forget, the barrel's got a hole up the middle. Yeah, well that's true. So, so you're not losing as much weight. So if you want, as it like. so what you're saying is if you want to save weight, you should shoot bigger bullets. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Just shoot a bigger projectile. Yeah. Then your barrel will be bigger and be more rigid. And a bigger hole up the middle, so yeah. it's lighter. Yeah. yeah. No, what you need to do is you need to shoot 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 barrels that have got deeper grooves. <laughs> rifling if the rifling grooves are deeper, then you're saving weight. It's just fluting, but on the inside. Three oh three. Oh fuck three oh three. It's the same depth of rifling as a three oh eight. Oh, it just looks better. When you look down a good three oh three barrel, it looks like a bloody corrugated road. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be wrong. So, and then the last couple of things that we got to talk about. Ross wanted us to mention that we have a Ruger uh, package, Ruger in two, three. Uh, these are incredibly difficult to get a hold of. So there must have been a delivery coming to Australia. So that's the, the one that takes the PMAX. So which are the AR style max. You can't get the bolt shut and the magazine's empty. You can stick your finger in and push the follower down. Yeah, you can. You can just drop the magazine out. Um, so yeah, so they're difficult to get. So we've got one of them in stock at the moment. I mean, I mean what, one sold in like probably Saturday, advertised on Friday, so yeah, they okay. go fast. The other one is you would have seen this. What we started to talk about was building a rifle which was well suited to what the Australian market wants. Because obviously there's a lot of products made in Europe and America and whatnot, and they're not necessarily very good for the Australian market. And we're sort of chucking ideas around exactly what people would want. What's not available on the market at the moment. And one of the things that we came up with is something like this. Now we probably wouldn't use a ticker action because the ticker actions are relatively more, you know, they're more expensive for, for what we do. There's not a huge advantage to it. You know, they feel nice and nice and stuff. And if anyone wants us to build one, that's fine. But what we're gonna start off with is a Howler action and then we're going to put an aftermarket barrel in it, TSC, so an Australian barrel, but it's going to be like 26 inches long because most people do want that extra velocity if you're doing a bit of long range shooting in a 6.5 Creedmoor. And that way you've got the advantage over the other people who've got factory 6.5 Creedmoors as well. So it's, it's 6.5 Creedmoor in a Howler, 26 inch custom barrel in a MDT stock. So, we wanted to throw it out there and see what you guys thought. Is that the sort of thing, is that like, what's your best idea for a general purpose rifle for Australian type shooting? What kind of gun do you like? What caliber, what sort of stock, that sort of thing? Like we come up with something like this cause it's gonna sell for under three grand. Like it's basically a custom rifle, semi custom rifle that you can come in and buy off the shelf for under three grand. And the other thing that we kept in mind when we were designing this was the um, the guys that shoot uh, the semi PRS style shooting because it really suits the rules of PRS style shooting because you're not allowed longer than 26 inch barrel uh, and it has to come under a certain weight restriction which this should just come under that weight restriction um, and it's in a caliber which is really well suited for calling your own shots and all that sort of stuff so like optimally. The best, the reason, and this is a question, in the PRS style matches, you're limited to 30 cal, you're limited to 175 gram projectile, and you're limited to 3200 feet per second. My idea was the 7 mil punchy, which we invented. It's, it, 7 mil 175 gram pill will outcompete a 308 175 gram, much higher BC. The, and the punchy case fires at just over 3000 feet per second. So it's under the 3200 feet per second. 
So it's ballistically one of the best calibers. So why aren't people using seven mils and stuff like that? Because you can't spot your shots. Because you've got to spot your own shots. Mm. If you miss, you need to be able to call it. You can do that with a 6.5 Creed mod. Much easier than with a yeah, 7 recoil. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. And you've still got good ballistic shaped bullets. So mm. Very out. exceptionally good ballistic so shaped bullets. Reach out yeah. to where a 7 mil will as well. Mm. Um, and less recoil. And, it, and it, it'll be under 3,000 feet per second, but mm. that doesn't matter. It's still got the legs to get right out. 1200 meters, 1200 meters, yeah. So we should, we're going to make a 6.5 punchy. Um, we were th I was thinking about a 6 mil as well. This is the thing, is that the, the, all, the, all the top guys are either shooting a 6 mil or they're shooting a 6.5. So it'd be interesting to see what people say in the comments, which one's your favourite, 6 mil or a 6.5. Now, if you're hunting game, most of the game sort of in Perth and <laughs> south, 6 mil is more than adequate. Yeah, you know, it's only when you're going for some of the bigger stuff like horses and donkeys and shit when you can do with a six point five. You know, um, you know. So as far as games concerned, yeah. six mil might be a better caliber, and that might lean people towards more of a six mil caliber yeah. because six mil cream is getting more popular as well. It's yeah. just like a short and two four three. Yeah. Personally, I don't see the point. Just fucking buy a two four three. Yeah. But two four threes you can't buy from the factory with anything other than one in nine. So you can't shoot the big long fills out of it. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny. I'll bet in twelve months or so there'll be factory rifles coming out with one in nine twin barrels in them. Or one and eight, one and eight in two, four, three. Yeah. I don't reckon it will. I don't reckon the demand's there. I reckon mm -hmm. everyone's going to go for six mil cream or yeah. one and eight. Right. But the two, four, threes, I reckon it's. Yeah. No one's making the ammo for it. Yeah. You know, no one makes a round yeah. from the factory yeah. with a one o five or a one fifteen. They make six mil BR from the factory one o fives. So and six mil cream or brass is being made. It's only a matter of time that ammo will get made with a one in one o five or a yeah. one ten or something like yeah. that. But I think 243 is just why it's yeah. it's been around since what the 1950s. Yeah, 58. It survived so so long, you know. So 1958. Mm. Yeah. So so yeah, be interested to find out what what's more popular, six mil or six point four. What do people want? Yeah. What do people want in like an off the shelf gun? Like what features do you want on? What's going to be optimal for? Is the a general purpose is the right. idea to have a barrel of the same profile as Similar to that, yeah. Yep. That's the tick of armor profile. Yeah. Only a 22 inch uh, that barrel. 24? Uh, 24. Ours will be 26. Yeah. Yeah. So the Weatherby's varmints are 20. Yeah. Howlers 24. Ticker is 24. Um, some of the howlers you can get in 26, but I'm not sure exactly which ones. Yeah. Um, but regardless, we want to put an aftermarket barrel in it. We want to put a, a Australian-made match barrel in it because that's the sort of thing that people want. You know, people want a really top-quality barrel for long-range shooting. You know, consistency and that sort of stuff. Internal finish is very important for that. So we want to ditch the factory barrel, put an aftermarket barrel in. The um. Oh, one of the things uh, about product availability is getting stuff from the US is like getting your grandmother involved. You know? Yeah, that's it. So it's really hard. Even though you might have to wait three months for a TSE barrel, at least you'll get it. That's absolutely right. You will get it when he says it'll be available. Yeah. Whereas with stuff from America now, you would find it, it's hard to get. They've run out of stock in the US. There's been so much buying going on over there. And uh, we're on the end of the line. Yeah. And it's good to be promoting a good top, you know, top notch Australian made product as yeah. well. Too. So there's been a lot of that. Land Forces is on this week. The what? Over in Queensland, the Land oh, Forces yeah. thing. Yeah. So where they're all showcasing everything's about you know, um, indigenous product. Yeah. It's about sovereign capabilities and that sort of stuff. Everyone manufacturing all their products in Australia for the Defence Force and that sort of stuff. So, it's, and it's good to see that the Australian government's getting behind Australian companies. Yeah. And if the Australian government can do something right for a change, maybe, then 
you'd hope everyone else could. The, the um, normally the Australian government goes for either the dearest or the cheapest. Nothing in between. Mm. When they're buying defence equipment. They're coming up, they've got they're redoing tanks. Where do we fight with fucking tanks anymore? <clears throat> How much is one tank gonna cost? A lot. You can probably buy twenty drones for the cost of a tank. Well, easily. You can buy Dig. twenty fucking drones. Dig. How many blokes could you clean up with a fucking You don't need to hold the big presence like the Americans have got that. You know, you never compete with them. Yeah. You don't want to be holding, you know, hearts and minds and all that sort of shit and having tanks and APCs and that. You just want to be quiet in the background with drones. That's where warfare's going, I reckon. It will be. Um, there'll be drone submarines as well. And that's one reason why I think they made a big blue and they may be, may be going to wiggle their way out of it. Made a big blue to, to uh, budget 90, million, 90 billion on submarines that we won't even get the first one until 2034, another bloody 13 years yet before they reckon there'll be the first one in the water. Well, how stupid is that? We could buy off the shelf stuff somewhere. Yeah, but if global warming happens and the and the sea ice rocks drop in and all the levels rise, we've got a lot more water to run around in our submarines. Oh, okay, yeah. Right. So, great idea. Covering a bigger area. Yeah, great idea. They're thinking ahead, you know. <laughs> Bull that, say. No. To go with it. No. There's, um, but yeah, coming back to what we were actually talking yeah, about. What we were talking about. Which is, yeah, Australian, ge- Australian, Australian product, you know. Mm-hmm. And yes, down the track we'll get to we'll even make our own action and that'll be it'll be all Australian, right? Mm-hmm. We get our own chassis, our own actions. Like Lithgo. But we've got to start from somewhere. Lithgo. What our chassis are No, Lithgo is used KRG fucking chassis. Yeah. It's an American chassis. Is it America? Is it? Yeah. I thought it was Australian. No. Oh. KRG. KRG is American. Oh, no, there's the company that does make chassis in Australia. Yeah. Southern yeah. Cross. Yeah, Southern Cross and um are APC made in Australia? No, not sure. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. You could have some special gear for it. I don't think I could do it on my gear. But you never know. We made it once before we made some. We'd have to come up with a good modular design. Yeah, we would. Would be, would be the best. But making them at the right price as well, that's yeah. the hard part. We don't have production capacity on yeah, yeah. hand making a chassis is going to be a little bit no, pricier than your XRS chassis. And if you want handmade, if you want sight suited, you know, like <laughs> five and a half thousand dollar rifle by the time you finish with it. Yeah. So yeah, so there hasn't been a lot going on this week. I was crook one of the days, so I, don't, I wasn't here. But um, so I'm still further behind than Python's ass, but I am getting on top of most of my. I've got about three or four jobs here on the go that I'm getting on top of, as well as doing all your crap. Oh, bull's ass done. I've got about three or four jobs on the go as well. Well, that's good. Yeah. We'll get the whip on you. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, we're going to pack up and go home. Hope you guys have an extra good long weekend. Yes, Don't forget yeah. that Monday is a public holiday. We will not be here, but we will be here tomorrow between 9 and 4. So we'll see you then. And just remember, double demerits. <laughs>